Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today we've got a bunch of great stories, including one of OP changing every student's grade in an entire class. But first, the story from Accomplished Debt 8968. HR won't pay for small change for extra time, results in company losing thousands of dollars. So I used to work in a factory that will leave unnamed due to confidentiality agreements. I worked on the line with the most profitable product. I worked the overnight shift. My shift started at 10 p.m. and was supposed to end at 6 a.m. Monday through Saturday, Sunday night being my only night off. We were expected to be there about 5 to 10 minutes early. This was in order to get situated and get in position to take over the line. This line was only supposed to be shut down in case of emergency and on Sunday mornings when the factory was closed for the day. This was because our line produced several thousands of dollars of product in a matter of minutes. I was always on time and in place when I was supposed to be, but in the morning, the morning shift would always be 5 to 10 minutes late, causing me to clock out 10 to 15 minutes late every day, amounting to at least an extra hour a week. Upon receiving my first paycheck, I realized that they weren't paying me for the extra time I was spending there to keep their machine running. I don't believe in, nor do, free labor. So I came home early one day and went to speak with HR to ask why they weren't paying me for my extra time. HR told me that it was my responsibility to make sure I clock out on time, because that's why the next shift was supposed to be there early. She told me she wasn't going to pay me for the extra time because it was my own fault for leaving late. I explained to her that the next shift kept coming in late. She told me that wasn't her problem and I needed to clock out on time. So come the next shift, I talked to the others in the line. They all looked it up on their check stubs and noticed the same discrepancy. We decided that if the next shift didn't show up on time, we would shut the line down at 5 till because that was just enough time to make it to the clock out. Of course, the next shift didn't show up on time, so we shut the line down, clicked out, and left. This continued for three or four days. On the fifth day, the HR lady made a special trip to the factory to meet us. She stated that we would be reimbursed for the hours that we hadn't been paid for previously, as well as any extra time we would gain in the future due to the next shift being late. The first shift was reprimanded, and I was there to hear exactly what was said to them. What I did find out was that due to us shutting down the line and them showing up late, plus starting procedures, they lost roughly 45 minutes of production time. This cost them thousands of dollars. When the company head saw the numbers and asked what was going on, the lady in HR got a demotion and we received our reimbursement. She decided not to pay us for the one to two hours a week, which amounted to about $19.50 per person for five people and ended up costing the company some tens of thousands of dollars. I guess while HR is there to protect the company, sometimes they also hurt the company, but I guess that's why they get fired, right? If you were an OP situation, would it pain you to know that you're shutting off those machines and costing the company tens of thousands of dollars? Or if anything, would it just be satisfying to know that your compliance is doing that much damage? Let me know what you think down in the comments. Our next story is from Yarn Tags. Told to change one student's grade, so I changed them all. I moved to a new state to take a high school teaching job in a rural town. I liked my fellow teachers and almost all my students, but this was a small town with the usual assortment of outsized attitudes. One student was particularly lazy. Her parents both worked in the small school district, admin at the high school, teacher at the middle school. She rarely turned anything in on time. And what was turned in was generally rushed or incomplete, as if she'd gotten the instructions secondhand. Somehow though, she had straight A's in all of her classes. I quickly figured out why. When she turned in another late, incomplete assignment, and I very generously gave it a D, her overall grade in class dropped to a B. I was called in the next day to a meeting with the principal and both of her parents, who immediately complained I was being unfair and capricious with my grades. They accused me of not giving students the instructions, so I showed them the instruction paper, which I passed out and went over in class. They accused me of not giving her specifically a copy, but I remember handing it to her, and I told them why. She was making up with her boyfriend when I was trying to go over the instructions. They didn't like hearing that part. They accused me of not being clear with the deadline, but it was the second line of the directions. They accused me of not fairly grading her work, but when I showed them her work, 
They clearly hadn't seen it before and wondered whether I'd gotten assignments mixed up before I showed them her name on it. The principal asked me to change the grade in the grade book. I asked about whether she'd have to redo the assignment first, but that was declined by her parents. I understand why my principal caved. It wasn't worth trying to fight two employees in a small, rural district already struggling to recruit people, so I went back to my classroom and changed every student's grade to a 100 in the grade book. No special treatment. Even the ones who hadn't turned in a single thing got a perfect score. The fallout? Many students asked me why their grade changed, but I never addressed it. I would just brush them off by saying not to worry about it, though clearly rumors were spreading like wildfire in the small school, because even the secretary and the principal asked me about it later on. I only said that yes, I changed her grade. The principal looked like he wanted to ask me about why I changed all the grades, but he just shrugged and walked away. He never interfered in my grade book after that. The student's parents transferred her out of my class, and her boyfriend also transferred a day later. No more PDAs in my class, finally, so no complaints. So I guess this will work out for this kid and their parents, but like what happens when they're done with high school? I'm willing to bet that this small town doesn't have some kind of community college that they can also go and bully those instructors or professors, right? Are they going to get a full ride to college so they can flunk? Are they going to take that 4.0 GPA high school degree and turn it into, does a high school degree even get you anything anymore? By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our next video is from Hobo Duchess, a firm clock in and out story with a twist. A few years ago, I was working at a school teaching one class but mainly running the after school programs and service learning programs. I was a contract employee paid salary over 12 months for the work. Because I had to stay later than all the other teachers who left by 3.30 or 4 to make sure everything went okay with the after school programs and so the supplies could be put back in my office, I was told I could come in later in the morning, which would be perfect because I had to drop my kids at the primary school and they started 45 minutes after us. So then they decided that we all had to clock in by 8 a.m. The program they used for this was an app on our phones that used our GPS to make sure we were on school grounds. If you clocked in after 8.04, you were considered late and were reprimanded with threats of docked pay, and if it happened more than three times a year, you lost an hour for every five minutes. It didn't matter that the clock out time was 4pm, and I didn't leave until 5 and we got no overtime, so I had an old phone that I didn't use anymore. I put the app on that phone and stashed it in my office. I mirrored that phone screen so I could log into it from my phone from anywhere. So I would log in from home at 7.50 in the morning and clock in. And of course, since we were required to clock out at 4 and couldn't even do it a minute early, now I was left with the problem that my office needed to be unlocked at 5 when the after school kids brought their supplies back. I noticed that the security guards checked all the locked doors at 4.30 and they always skipped mine assuming I was there. This was a boarding school, so the kids lived on campus, and my office was next door to a huge student lounge. So I talked to a couple of students I knew were really good kids and popular. I told them that if they made sure my office was in perfect shape at the end of the night, then they could go in there and borrow all the board games and video games and sports equipment I had, and take some of the snacks I had in there that I replenished once a month. So I just never locked my office. I did that for my last two years there clocked in from home and walked out the front gate at 4 p.m. exactly every day, even if it meant walking out of meetings. Not great, but I was proud of the setup I had. Isn't this basically a form of time theft? I mean, you gotta make do with what you can, you're just trying to make it by and make things work for you. But I can't imagine that if anybody actually found out about what OP was doing here, that it would necessarily end too well for them. Couldn't there have been some kind of actual, like, legal repercussions for this? Our next story is from Arthur Sleep, Collective Supermarket Malicious Compliance. I'll preface this by saying that my local big Tesco's recently cleared half of its checkouts for more self-scan. The new self-scan are for trolley shops only. Today, being Sunday, the shop was rammed. No trolleys or baskets in their usual places when I arrived, and tons of people apparently doing a last-minute bits shop both my kids and I had our arms stacked with the aforementioned last minute bits. Cashiers had extraordinarily long queues, as did the basket self-serve. The trolley self-service was clear, 
people were naturally gravitating towards the totally clear checkouts, only to be told that it was for trolleys only. Regardless of the amount of stuff people, me in particular, were trying to juggle. A few people took umbrage to this and decided that they needed a trolley for their bread and milk, or their bag of potatoes and a broccoli. I didn't have the level of commitment that they did, so I watched it all start to unfold. Baskets left to be replaced with trolleys and through the checkout. Truth be told, it was probably quicker to just wait in the queue, but the malicious compliance was quite fabulous to watch. No, I'm not gonna lie, if I was in that situation and the lines were jam-packed and they're like, no, 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 trolleys only, you know darn well I'm taking my one loaf of bread over to the trolleys and going right through that self-checkout because why not? What are they gonna say? It's a trolley checkout. What are they gonna do, gatekeep the amount of items you can carry in a trolley all of a sudden? Our next story is from Alweni, piggybacking on other HOA posts, but with a twist. I'm on my HOA's board of directors. Okay, I'm the president, shoot me. So our governing documents list any external change that requires an application. Fences, sheds, tree removal, things like that. Oh, and flowers, even annuals. The board didn't write the governing docs, the builder did, but we're still legally obligated to uphold them, no matter how ridiculous we find them. We can change them, but number one, it's a big expense. Lawyers want money for some reason. Number two, we have to get 66% of the homeowners to agree to the change. We can't even get 25 people to a meeting, and we have 230 plus homes. Needless to say, it ain't happening anytime soon. Did I mention the board thinks it's a stupid rule? Unfortunately, we can't just ignore the rule if we don't like it. That can lead to homeowners saying things like selective enforcement and neighbors eat planted flowers without permission. I don't need permission to build a full-size bird of prey replica in my backyard. So darned if we do, darned if we don't. Unless, in most HOAs, homeowners can request a variance. If the rule creates an undue hardship, if a homeowner wants to install something in a setback or easement, etc., the HOA doesn't have to approve it, but the option exists. Cue a maniacal cackling. I hatched a plan. An evil plan. I created an online survey where homeowners could request a variance to the application requirement for flowers. Everyone who signed up received a digital waiver request, which was then forwarded to the board. The reasoning for the variance? I believe this restriction is unnecessary and overly burdensome as the exterior of my lot will not change, just the flowers in the flower beds. I agree to submit applications for all other items in the governing documents. I wanted to include something about the builders being poopy heads, but I save that for a different day. About 40 homeowners requested the waiver and variance, which the board granted in mass. What do we have here? 20% of homeowners who don't have to follow a rule? Guess that makes the rule unenforceable for everyone. Flowers for you and you and you. Please, no hate for being on my HOA's board. I realize that HOAs have bad reps for being governed by power-hungry, petty, and noxious Karens, but my board's pretty chill. Just mow your lawn, pay your dues, and bring in your trash cans. I can get behind an HOA like this that has reasonable people leading it and reasonable rules. The thing I can't get behind is it seems like, with a lot of these HOAs, all it takes is one power-hungry maniacal person like OP said to insert themselves in there, make their way to the top, and just, next thing you know, you can't park a certain type of vehicle in your driveway. All of a sudden, you're getting a 30 days notice written warning because your house is the wrong shade of beige. It's nice if it's reasonable, but does it ever stay that way? Can you guarantee that? This next story is from Captain Zippy. You want me to work during the day? Sure. A few jobs back, I was a callow youth on my second proper IT job. The place was quite relaxed and, being somewhat of a night owl, I worked the late shift, usually about midday to 9pm, and got quite a lot of things done when there were less users around to complain about interruptions, especially server upgrades. We had Solaris file servers in various places throughout the town, and I would generally publicize an upgrade that would take the system down at 5pm and it would be back up by 9am the next morning. This included the time to back up the data in single user mode, cause dump slash dump fs preferred that, upgrade any hardware, usually none cause while they were relaxed they were also underfunded, reinstall the OS, restore the data, and tidy things up. I would generally work through the night to get this done, clocking off at about 4am when the user data restore was happening, 
and be back at 10 to 10.30 to pick up any immediate issues. So I'd got into an email ding-dong with one of my colleagues, he was wrong of course, and it had expanded to include the boss, who told us to sort it out. I proved my point with data, and then it all went quiet. A couple of days later, the boss says he's had complaints about my timekeeping, and he'd like to see me in at 9 from now on. I guess that the colleague had complained, and so I asked the boss directly, and he said he couldn't tell me that, but his facial expression made it obvious. So, I said okay, and shifted my life around for the new schedule. About three weeks after this, I was due to upgrade the IT department server, and I said that it would take a little longer because I was only doing 9 to 5, and nobody really commented. So Monday morning, I take the system down to single user mode and start the user data backups. Two exabyte tapes using dump, one megabyte, it was pre-2000 and I think the upgrade was from Solaris 2.5.1 to 2.6, and let it run for most of the day. Around about 3pm I change tapes and start the OS and utils backups. 5 p.m. I go home. 9 a.m. the next day, I roll in with a coffee and start the reinstall from CD Media and then sit down and check the console occasionally. Starting at about 10.30, there's a stream of people asking when the server will be back up. Maybe towards the end of the day, maybe early tomorrow, depends on the tape speed restores, I say. People are not getting their work done. Those machines that didn't boot off the server, sun diskless clients, and had PCs or Macs still had their email and home directories on the server to ensure backups, am I right? So the entire department is sitting around doing not a lot, mainly answering phone calls, creating local documents, surfing the web, such as it was back then. About four-ish, the boss turns up and says, okay, you've made your point, when will the server be back up? I say, depends. I can have it all working when people come in tomorrow, or I can start working on it again tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. What's your call? And that's how I got my new 10.30 to 11 start time negotiated. I should say that boss was a reasonable dude. We generally got on, and he admitted the benefit of me working those hours in our subsequent conversations. He was also kind enough to only schedule meetings involving me in the afternoons. All these people just didn't have a clue how IT operates, I guess. It kind of blows your mind nowadays knowing how IT works, as far as servers and maintenance goes, to think that they would want them to only work from 9am to 5pm. Imagine going to your workplace, you get to your computer terminal that is 100% hardwired to the company server, and finding out, oh well so and so from IT is rebooting the server and updating something so you won't have any access till tomorrow. I wonder how much money this actually ended up costing that company. Our next story is from Master Protection 29. When are we there yet is a bad word. Gen Xer here, and this is a story from my childhood. You know, the age of lap seat belts in the back. Those little rotating triangle windows all smokers used as ashtrays. And auto AC is a fancy pants luxury. Family was on one of our epic visit the family on the other coast road trips. I was most likely middle school age at the oldest, definitely not a tween yet. Dad had a rule of all necessities were done when you stopped to fill up the car. The restroom, food, and drinks were all performed during the time it took to fill the fuel tank. But no drinks or food in the car because if seatbelts and AC were a luxury, cup holders were a pipe dream and bottled water was so bougie it hadn't been conceived yet. Between my sister and I, the words, are we there yet, must have been spoken one too many times on this trip in particular. There's also a limited amount of time a child can nap or sit quietly in a car before pent-up energy causes a body to gyrate uncontrollably in time and space. Dad says, The next time someone says, are we there yet, I'll paddle you black and blue. Misery like a wet blanket has landed in the back seat. No fussing, no arguing, and no apparent end to looking at passing fence posts out the window. These are the fun times of road tripping, the sun is setting, bladders are full, stomachs growling, butts numb, and I'm at my breaking point. I say, so, um, we got a ways to go yet, don't we? Sister snickering cause I'm about to get my butt whooped. Then an odd sound comes from my mom, a barely contained and muffled sound of giggles. Dad gets ready to stop on the shoulder to give me my paddling, and mom saves me. She says, don't you dare, she didn't say the forbidden words. 
you know, that mom tone that stops all in their tracks? Yep, that one. Dad groans and continues on. Mom's giggle continues for a while. Then between giggles, the forbidden words fall from her lips. Are we there yet? Followed by full-blown laughing from her, and the pure disgruntlement of my dad is heard in the saddest dad groan that had ever fell on my young ears. I don't remember anything else from that trip, just the satisfaction in mom's unlimited glee. It was also the last family road trip when it was determined I was old enough to fly out east to visit family. Yes, a child could fly unaccompanied by an adult. We got our paperwork hung over our head in a translucent envelope, just a bigger version of our house keys. We boarded first hangout in the cockpit while everybody else was loading and received our own plastic wing pins to wear and the flight crew would always sneak an extra drink and snacks to you at the end of the flight if you behaved. The story recited, and by some embellished, by both parents, grandparents, and sister a plethora of times over the years, 40-ish years, to the point of people thinking it urban legend, told at times to embarrass and others in ways of warning, I've always looked upon it as a badge of creativity for my young, timid self. I'm definitely no Gen Xer, but I remember days where I was driven around in cars with those little triangle windows you pop open, no cup holders in the back, windows that you did have to crank down. Ashtrays and smoking were definitely considered in the designs of those vehicles. Our next story is from Starry Eyed Jen. Give your brother water. This happened years ago when I was a kid, 10 year old female, with my brother, 15 year old male. I grew up in a household where females are to cater to men. And once during dinner, my brother asked me to get him water. Growing up in the US, I was not of the cater to men mindset. Even though my parents tried to force me, cultural differences. I said no when my brother asked because his empty cup was right in front of him and right next to him was the water cooler. He literally didn't even have to get up to get water, that's how close it was. He could just grab his cup and turn. But no, the jerk wanted me to get up and go around the table to get him water. My parents both got angry with me for saying no. I did explain my no and told me to get him water. He's older than you and he's your brother, their argument. So I get up, grab his cup and fill it with water. I turn to hand it to him and he has his hand out to grab it. Before he can reach for it, I flip the cup over, spilling the water on his lap and say, here's your water. Of course, my parents were even more pissed at what I did and the mess. They did force me to clean it up, but considering my lack of effort in trying to clean it up, I got a couple of napkins and placed it on the floor. They ended up having my brother clean it up since they didn't want to. Another thing about cleaning, the family always thought I sucked at doing dishes when I just simply hated doing it and left them still dirty so they wouldn't even ask me to do the dishes. As an adult now, yes I do clean my dishes thoroughly. I'm not gonna lie, I kind of relate to OP here though. Growing up, doing the dishes was definitely a chore not high up on my list. I mean, don't get me wrong, there probably is no chore that I would consider high up on my list, but at least something like vacuuming is a little bit more satisfying because you get to see the floor get cleaner every time you go over it. To me, there's nothing fun about scraping old dried food off of a dinner plate. This next story is from Helpful Candidate 92 The fence is wider on the other side. This story is something my mother did when they moved into the home they live in now. Where they moved to was a commercial apartment and condo place with an HOA. To paint the picture, this place has six large house condo buildings that were all the same and standard eight home apartment buildings. All the rent to own condos have a porch area in the back that leads to a parking lot, some of which my mother's noticed has fences. My mother's handled mostly all of getting the house ready and dealing with the HOA. She learned pretty quick that you had to get permission to do just about anything here. So after we move in, she sent in a request to put in a privacy fence, like many of the others in the area. With the HOA's approval and guidelines, she finds a contractor, which she discovered was an old childhood friend, surprise, and has the fence put in. QHOA. My mom submits the contractor's document stating the kind of fence and color and specs, only for her to receive a letter stating her fence needs to be removed due to not meeting HOA standards. Their reasoning, the technical term for the color white of the fence doesn't match what they allow. Best example would be they allow paper white, but it was labeled eggshell. They stated they would find my mother every day the fence stood. 
My mother attempted to explain that the specific brand only used that white. To get the other white, you had to use a different, more expensive fence brand. My mother was peeved to say the least. She went as far as to take pictures of all the fences, hers included, and demanded the HOA distinguish which was hers at a monthly meeting. They couldn't, but still didn't care. The paperwork didn't match. Thankfully, she had a friend in the contractors. She called them back and spoke with them about what the HOA said, and they hatched their plan. My mother and the contractor pull up the fence, and the HOA watches it's taken away in a day. The next day, the same fence comes back and gets put in again. This time, the paperwork says, paper white. It's been years, and my mother still has the same fence. The HOA never said anything further. Those fees were never paid, but it's fine. My mom doesn't use the pool anyway. You know how earlier in this video I was talking about how some HOAs could be cool and some aren't? Yeah, this is, uh, this is a good example of the ones that aren't so cool. And our final story of the day is from Barks2K12. The director of IT tries to overstep and abuse her power, and it ends up deleting our only copy of our computer image. Just to clarify, this was the IT director at a government agency, basically meaning manager. It's not about the director of the movie. This happened around 2010. I work in IT for a state agency. Since it's government, our leadership positions are mostly appointed by the governor rather than being promoted from within. As a result, we had a director of IT who knew nothing about IT. We'll call her Karen. Karen came from a completely different unit, and due to a union dispute over a hostile work environment, she was reassigned to our unit rather than fired. This frequently happens with appointees. They don't like to fire them because it makes the governor look bad. Unsurprisingly, the unit began going downhill after she took over because she was extremely emotional and tried to micromanage everything. My normal job duties involve computer repair and networking, covering multiple offices. I volunteered to help the main capital office create our computer software image, naively thinking it would help me get promoted, but all in all, it was just tedious and was starting to cause me to fall behind in my normal duties. I'd been working on the image for about six months, updating it when needed. For those who aren't IT savvy, an image is a snapshot of the computer hard drive, fully loaded with all of the drivers and software already installed. To do this manually would take four to five hours on every computer, whereas using an image would take about 40 minutes. We work very standard hours, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. On Thursday at 4 p.m., we get an urgent message from Karen stating that we all must report to the main office Friday morning at 9 a.m. and to bring our USB drives. We were told that if we didn't bring the flash drives, we would be sent back to go get them. She didn't say why. Obviously, I wasn't happy about how unprofessional it was to give such little notice about a meeting that requires a two-hour drive one way and to reschedule my entire day of meetings for PC repairs. I called some associates who worked in our main office to find out what was going on. Apparently, Karen had convinced herself that IT support might have bad stuff on the drives, completely on a whim. Mind you, they didn't have software to track it. The plan was to collect all flash drives, wipe them, and then give them back without telling us. The sheer stupidity of this idea was off the charts, considering we kept all of our important troubleshooting tools on there plus the image. Since I did the imaging, my flash drive had all the source files for the image. All of our software, drivers, multiple versions of Windows, along with the complete documentation of how to set it all up. We had no backup policy, but I did keep a personal backup of the drive. Q malicious compliance. I was not happy about how Karen did not tell us what was being done or why. I deleted my personal backup and decided to just play dumb and came to the meeting and turned in the drive. Surely they would be smart enough to say something, anything before doing this, but nope. Sure enough, they were wiped without our consent or knowledge and then given back to us. A few weeks go by and they ask me about how things are going with the image. I simply tell them it's been erased by Karen without my knowledge, so unfortunately, there was nothing I could do, and I'm not about to recreate it all from scratch. Most of IT support lost their copies as well during that meeting, and all the networking team had was a backup from years ago before I took over. Honestly, at this point, I was sick of volunteering my time for nothing in the main office. 
and it was making my normal job much harder, so I was happy to wash my hands of that. Needless to say, Karen was pissed, but she couldn't do a darn thing about it, since it is their job to create backups and manage them, not mine. They had to recreate the image and documentation completely from scratch. Dozens of hours of work. Karen was eventually reassigned to another unit, and things got better in IT after that. I'm kind of like a folk hero in that agency now. Everyone was very happy to have Karen gone. You gotta love politics and people finding their way into positions that they have no business dealing with. Just totally go and tank the government IT sector here. Just brilliant work. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another compliance story that was way crazier than any of the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.